Greetings and welcome back to another Blue Monday, Monday Blue talk. I'm here with none other than Blue Monday, Monday Blue. He's got two blues this time. Let's see what we're talking about politics. I want to start the talk off with a question that not many people ask, maybe because it's a really stupid question, I have no idea. But when we look back in modern American history, people kind of look at the Vietnam War as... I'm wondering if that'll get the video demonetized in the Vietnam War. Well, too late. Uh, Vietnam War as a kind of trigger event for a lot of things. You know, the hippie movement, the anti-establishment uh, movement, all that sort of stuff. We have, I wouldn't call them movements, but we certainly have a, a tendency these days that we're all aware of uh, towards what some people refer to as being W O K E N E S S, just to you know spell it out, and all this other associated stuff. And I've been trying to figure out if there has been some trigger event similar to, say, the parts of the '60s and parts of the '70s that led to. Of course, it wasn't just the Vietnam War. I wanted to ask you what your thoughts on that were. I mean, you mentioned, <clears throat> pardon me, that you had allegedly grown up with these people mm, in the D.C. area. Yeah. Um, so maybe it wasn't a some major event, but rather the way they were raised and now their parents. But the people, on the other hand, the people who seem really... Uh, Awake, I'll use that as a euphemism because I think that word is, yeah, are a bit older, I think. Um, they're sort of older teenagers, young, young people in general. I think Jonathan Haidt said something to the effect of it wasn't until 2014 ish mm -hmm. that these people started to, you know, pop up on the radar at universities and what have you. So, any thoughts on that? Um, was there a triggering event I, besides the 2016 election? Um, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah. There, there's a, a graph that Tim Pool shows about how the left has pulled even further left since the Obama presidency. Like it, it's, it, I think it was based on a, a New York, from a New York Times article, you know, whereas the right stayed pretty much where it's been. Um, but, you know, like why would the Obama presidency be where they veered even harder and harder left uh that's a good question and as far as growing up around these kinds of people yeah unfortunately i did and one of the things we're seeing at a national stage now is the kind of stuff that they would do in their private lives so i think that's one of the reasons why we see uh the them trying to silence people is because they did it in their private lives they ostracized any dissenting voices and it worked they drove people away or silenced people you know in their whether the office place or in their friendship groups or, in, in, you know, in schools. And now they're trying to replicate that strategy at a larger level. You know, the question is, will it work? I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. It looks like, unfortunately, it's probably not working as well as they think it is, but unfortunately, it looks like it's in the general trend of working. Um, but was there a trigger event? You're right. There was no, there, since you brought up the Vietnam War, that, you, you do make a good point with that, that that was like a triggering event back in the 60s. Hmm. But I can't think of exactly a, a good equivalent, you know, within the last, you know, within the last 10, 20 years that would, because it, it's almost like the 2016 election revealed what was lying dormant, hmm. but not not quite the same way the, the Vietnam War did it um that's a that's it you know i think it would, you i think you bring up a, a good and interesting comparison because and i guess a good question too would be well i get think part of the th reason for the 2016 election was they really thought their candidate was going to win they really thought final victory was within their grasp and then you know defeat was snatched from what they thought was the jaws of victory and from their point of view, and I've heard, uh, I've heard some of these kind of people say what I'm about to say is that, you know, nobody likes the president, is what they'll tell you. 
they'll completely ignore polls. They'll completely ignore the fact that half the voting population voted for them. Because in their social bubbles, in their social worlds, everyone basically agrees or remains silent. So from their point of view, from their day-to-day -day point of view, they're correct that nobody likes the president. So they probably think it was just like a hundred hillbillies and inbred hillbillies in their trailers that got them elected. And, hmm. I mean, I guess pointing to the 2016 election is the easy way to do it. But it was probably part of a trend that started earlier. Like, like I mentioned with the, uh, the Tim Pool graph uh, about how the left went a lot further left since Obama. Um, well, you mentioned the people you grew up with. Mm. Uh, you said they, you know actively ostracize people. Could you give an example of, of this type of behavior you, you observed at the time? Um, it's very similar to what you see. Uh, the S, I don't want to get demonetized, but the, uh, the, the people who like the justice of uh, the social kind. Yes. Yeah. Um, the kind of behaviors that they do, the like they go into this freak out mode where they can't stop themselves. Um, that that's one of the things that they'll do. That's the, like the big obvious behavior. But I still remember sitting in a college class, you know, 20 years ago, listening to a woman talk about, she didn't like people who were religious. And she's like, her, her opinion was something like, um, you know, if you want to say those things in your home behind closed doors, you know, you go ahead and do that, but, but don't bring that into the public sphere at all, ever, anywhere. And, why they can't stand any type of dissenting voice in the public sphere. I'm not, I'm not quite sure why they're so hypersensitive about it. I mean, we could, you know, analyze it in terms of power that there's, if there's only one narrative and everyone's forced to agree to it. Then the, you know, the ruling class gets to maintain their power however they want. Um, but it seems like it's a more personal thing for them. It's like, it's part of their, their mental makeup to, mm. to be this way. Uh, and, um, I've mentioned before uh, on my channel, like, like starting when I was in middle school, I remember the some of the girls were very sexist against guys, and when they would when you call them out on their sexism, say, hey, you know, what you're, you know, the the way you're making fun of boys is is sexist. They would say, well, you know, boys oppressed girls throughout all of history, so we're just getting even. Um, some of it came out in not exactly a political way because this is back before identity politics was uh, real big. It wasn't um, necessarily directly political, but it was things like groups of women talking about how stupid and useless their boyfriends and husbands were. And they were doing this in the work environment, which actually was creating a hostile work environment for men, but nobody would stop them. No one would stand up against them. The management just overlooked what they were doing. I guess by that point, they had so much power they couldn't be stopped or something along those lines. Um, not quite sure what to think of. I wonder if that's that a universal, I've, had female relatives and I've caught wind of that often the sort of oh my boyfriend's so stupid he can't do this or my right. husband something like so that useless. yeah, yeah I've, I've I've heard that witnessed that from I'm not I'm wondering if that's more of a universal thing that uh used to be much more hush hush but nonetheless was, was prominent yeah it might have been more hush hush and that became uh more prominent yeah uh, I mean occasionally I would run across um, these types of people, well, they're not exactly the same type, but leftist types who were principled. Um, when I was in high school, I had a, a neighbor college professor who was also a feminist, mm -hmm. but I was shocked when I found out that she was a principled feminist because uh, she was talking about the kind of things that women will do in, in work environments to make it hostile for men to be there. And she didn't approve because her anti-sexism was principled anti-sexism. And it surprised me because I'm like, oh, wow, you're like the only feminist I know who's who thinks this way, or at least that I was aware of, you know, who thought that way. Hmm. Uh, but for the most part, I, I don't, see, I don't want to say they're unprincipled uh, in their anti-sexism because I'm not sure they even understand really what principles are. Uh, I, or, or even sometimes I'm not even understand, sure they understand at a basic level um, what's important, like... Uh, why rules are important because i remember a um I remember this one guy talking about how he thought it was so stupid that um what do you call it uh 
that you couldn't go through a red light at like 2 a.m. when no one else was there. And I'm like, well, why is that stupid? It's still a red light. He's like, well, it's stupid because no one's there. Why should I have to obey the rule to not go through a red light? And I'm like, well, you have to apply rules evenly, you know, rule. I'm like, I'm not going to explain the concept of rule of law to you, but apparently he got pulled over by a cop and got a ticket for it. Hmm. So they seem to even think about basic things like rules very differently than, I don't want to say everyone else, but a lot of other people do, if that makes sense. They, well, I mean, that's an example of, I mean, maybe it's extrapolating too much, but a personalized grievance. So the guy runs a red light, 2 a.m., whatever, technically a violation of rule, no one's around, whatever. And so it, it, that rule bothers him. Likewise, I think these people who don't say see the, the point of rules where people are treated fairly, for example, uh, if they do support them, it's just on a really emotional, visceral level. They don't really see mm. the, the the bigger picture, and it's a sort of classic example for a lot of these types of uh, you know rules for me or not for thee or vice versa mm. when you know <clears throat> this won't apply to me because <clears throat> my feelings are that much more important mm. or it should apply to you because you're a bad person and you say bad things and I mean it, it, herein lies the hypocrisy with a lot of these people I'm just really interested in finding that if, I mean yeah 2016 definitely unleashed a lot of things Mm. But the something had been lying dormant. Lying in wait. Yeah. yeah, and it just like a like a beast hibernating, or now a bear hibernating. I I just don't know. I've been trying to think about what it could be, um, it, because it does seem so sudden. And this is all anecdotal, obviously. But a guy like Jonathan Hyde who's looked into it just doesn't said all this craziness didn't start until about 2014. In terms of the you know the age categories of students going to university, I remember watching a um, uh, a Joe Rogan with him, and he was talking about um, I I think the topic was increased rates of teenage girl suicide. Yes, I think that was it. And he mentioned how like this was all when social media first really took off, like we got really really big. Um. And it seems like social media has unleashed something that we haven't seen before. It's like creates a pressure cooker kind of environment. Um, and I, I, I've seen other people make this commentary, like back in the 1970s, there was, I think like a thousand different, uh, I'm trying not to get demonetized, but, um, uh, you know, devices that go pop Yes. around the country, around the America. Mm -hmm. And, um, that was back when it was just local media. So the local newspaper might report on it, you know, like a building went pop or a car went pop yeah, uh, in downtown or, or wherever. But it didn't travel nationally. It couldn't, it didn't have the, the, the uh, instant, like, I mean, now you can get news on Twitter before you can get it on the TV sometimes. Yes. You know, because somebody, somebody with a cell phone starts shooting a video and say, hey, look what's happening here in Philadelphia. Oh, my God. And then they get you know a million retweets, and everyone finds out about it on Twitter before you find mm -hmm. out about it on you know on a regular uh, television network station. Yeah, th and this is sorry. Go on. It, what I was going to say was, so if if those if we had the social media back then during the seventies when all those poppings were happening, would that have created the pressure cooker to make something to make things completely spiral out of control? You know, I don't know. Um, but that that might, I might you know it's one of the differences between history and, and what's going on now is that it you know the the pressure that would, what appears to be some kind of pressure cooker environment or hot house environment that that social media has created and sorry I interrupted you go ahead no I I did to you I have a couple of, well a, a theory you know bound up within other theories um, the poppinines uh, so to speak yeah there used to be there used to be tons of them um, and on aggregate levels of um, 
God, I got, you, <laughs> this verbal hopscotch is really tricky. I know. Right? You know bad, bad things involving physicality that happened to people in the U.S. were, were much greater. Uh, yeah. I mean, I know for a fact in my city of my birth, New York City, it's in the 70s, it was much more violent. Um, yeah. There was a famous cleanup, supposedly done under the great work of Rudy Giuliani. But I mean, it, 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 it's just known if you look at the stats and you investigate it. These physical, un, these unpleasant physical happenings were much more common. Um, now, the thing about social media, I, I would argue, yeah, probably it would. You, as you pointed out, you find about anything within. In our, for example, I found out the other day it was on a, that um, some major forest fire in the Amazon caused essential blackening of the sky over Sao Paulo and Brazil for a couple hours. Yeah. Well, I never would have heard about that you know, if I hadn't just crossed my, my path on just surfing. Yeah, or you might have heard about it like a month later. Mm, yeah. You know. Now, one theory that this isn't just my own, a lot of people propose this, is that how we evolved, we're hyper aware to look out for danger and problems. Yeah. We like to problematize everything. And problematic has become sort of a meme, but what, when there isn't enough acute danger in your own personal environment, i.e. things are really safe in general these uh -huh. days and are quite okay for, sure. for most metrics, you start looking elsewhere. And you also start making uh, many mountains out of what would be molehills or even smaller structures. So <clears throat> the combination of social media... So take these recent poppinings that occurred... Um, involving, uh, in one case, supposed white soup cream. In another case, it's not clear. I think the, the person was... Uh, the second guy, yeah, I know you mean. Yeah. Yes, was uh, interested in, in flowers and what have you and yeah. other things. And so that happened back in the day, these sorts of things. Just, you didn't really hear about it till you know a couple of days later if you were thousand miles removed or whatever and so yeah. we're just we'd like to home in on on danger <clears throat> i'll give you an right. example this was years ago um back when youtube was much younger and inarguably much freer uh, karen strong this is uh, when she had entered the scene as girl rights what was commenting on this was still during i guess the great recession some some article in a Vancouver newspaper where uh, apparently women's injuries had supposedly gone up, right, in the workplace. Mm -hmm. But when upon closer examination and scrutiny, what actually had happened is so many men had been put out of work due to the Great Recession uh, that... Uh, there's just fewer men on the job to get injured, mm. but men were still disproportionately being injured at higher rates. It's just right. there, there was much more unemployment for men. But people yeah. were completely glaring over that um, because they wanted to hope. I mean, we we're most, more concerned about women than men. We know that. We yeah. focus on that, hyper-focus on that. So I so, think yeah. this is a problem maybe this our problem with our, our evolution, with our psychology, that no matter how okay things are, and I mean, if you think about the bigger picture, violence has been endemic to our species. This this yeah. is highly exceptional. You know, being relative, even in a place like the yeah. United States, which in urban environments can be, it, it's quite safe compared yeah. to a hundred years compared to hundreds yeah, of years ago. Yeah. Forget about that. And then a couple. I mean danger you know 24 hours a day so we're, yeah. we're, clearly we evolved in that environment to be really really aware of this sort of thing and and these sort of things and here's another uh, possible theory <clears throat> that people on the left tend to be higher in neuroticism than people on the I right i would believe that yeah 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 i um, believe that yeah and 
when you're very neurotic, you, you, you potentially have the, there's the risk of projecting and worrying about every little thing. Now, unfortunately, I've been cursed with neurotic genes. I don't project to other people and I contain it, but it personally, it, it ruins me. It, it affects my sleep. I worry, you know. And so if you imagine a lot of people like that who are a lot less restrained and think that either neuroticism is a reflection of both reality and, and, and should be projected in the reality and, and other people, um, yeah, you're going to worry because in an evil. So you bring up. Go, go ahead. Just for a final very, point. Very e evolutionary yeah. context, it makes sense. I mean, you don't get these traits handed down if they're totally useless. I'd say neuroticism is a bad trait to have these days uh, from personal experience. But obviously, if you're in an ancestral environment with, you know, saber toothed cats and cave lions or whatever, yeah, I mean, being aware and, and paranoid about things it could save your life potentially. But it's not as useful now. And so, yeah, I think that these various things combined make people very antsy, even though if you looked at the landscape, they probably shouldn't be. Yeah. Right. Now you bring up a, a very interesting point um, with the neuroticism thing. And there's a, a term that uh, the subscribers can, can Google because there's a good, good New York times article on this. I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent with it, but I'm going to bring it right back. I promise. Um, there's a phenomenon uh, called gang stalking where what supposedly is happening is organized groups of individuals are stalking one person to basically torment them and ruin their lives. And you can find websites and subreddits dedicated to the phenomenon of gang stalking. Now, the thing is, when people have actually like gone in and looked at, and the New York Times article talks about this, people have actually looked at this, what it really is, is it's people with uh, pretty serious mental illness, like like paranoia, like clinically diagnosable paranoia, who think that this is happening to themselves. And then they go on the internet and they run into a bunch of other people with like clinically diagnosable paranoia. And they all start talking to each other and they all agree. They're like, yeah, yeah, no one else in the world understands that uh, this kind of stuff is happening. And, and it's not just, they think that they're being spied on by in, you know, like the woman, the lady at the train station was, was following me today. It's not just that it's, They'll talk about things like how the uh, the government has secret satellite programs that are reading their minds or broadcasting signals into their minds, and they go they go pretty far off into uh, like weirdo land. And they all get together on the internet and they start talking to each other. And since they all, I don't want to say they have similar experiences, but it's a it's a similar like type of mental illness. And the New York Times article mentioned that they they there was some academic I don't know who it was who looked into some of these cases, maybe about, I'll say it was about 50 of them. They actually gave it the number. I don't remember what was off the top of my head. And like 48 of them, it was obvious that something was wrong with the person and was, and they were experiencing some type of paranoia. And then like the two other cases, uh, there might've actually been something there, but I don't mean, um, I don't mean satellites beaming thoughts into your head. I mean like that they, these people may have actually been getting harassed. So what you're seeing in this case is organized mental illness. A bunch of people with paranoia who are convinced that shadowy international organizations or shadowy government organizations are spying on them and trying to ruin their lives all get together and start talking to each other, validating each other's beliefs. Mm -hmm. And then I thought about that and I was like, you know, we're kind of seeing the same thing with what's going on now, how, you know, there's this white soup cream everywhere, you know, I mean, it's not true, but if you have a bunch of people who are getting together online and all talking about it and convinced about it, or I don't know if you saw that um, that news broadcast, it was a former FBI director, I don't know if he was a director or assistant director or something like that, talking about how um, tr uh, the president was lowering the American flag for, I can't remember which event happened. Some people passed away. He was lowering the he was lowering the flag until August eighth, you know the eighth month, the eighth day of the eighth month, you know eighty eight, which hmm. is a number associated with white soup cream, and how that uh, you know it, it couldn't be like it wasn't a coincidence. It was a secret signal to certain members uh, that were following the president. I mean that just sounds it sounds crazy to me that that you would even connect those dots 
you would think that the president is this subtle and sinister to send you know, he's sending this kind of signal to uh, white soup cream out there. And I have to wonder if if what we're seeing, and because of social media, because everyone can talk, you know, at a national level, is if we're seeing something like organized mental illness with some of this stuff. So it's not just a pressure cooker. It's a bunch of people with. I well, I don't, I don't know if high trait neuroticism is necessarily yeah. an indication of mental illness. It certainly, can be oh, yeah, debilitating. Well, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. It just when you brought up neuroticism, it reminded me of this. Mm, yeah. Um, but the, I was, I'm not trying to argue they're all neurotic. Sorry. Yeah, they might all be. But again, I mean, having there's a risk of having being not neurotic at all. I mean, if you're really you know low and and uh, and that then you know, then you won't perceive danger at all. Yeah, yeah exactly. So I mean, I'm, I don't know if it, but but certainly in the extremities, when everyone gets together, and that's the general trend. And more specifically, you see this. I mean, not just with white soup cream, but with with many echo chambers online, where people will spend time together and just nod their heads in agreement because they're all on the same page. Right. Because all they do is spend time. I see this right right leaning servers too. Um, mm -hmm. It it goes both ways. It cuts both ways. Uh, that that's another phenomenon of of the internet. But with regards to you know these worries about you know things perpetually being not okay in more left-leaning circles. Yeah, I, I think that there probably is some element of that um, perception, uh, sort of a misaligned perception of danger. That mm. you know, or and some of them I just think are you know on a bandwagon basically. So you know things are actually pretty good for say for women and minorities these days overall right but unless it's perfect or you have perfect equity and representation or whatever i mean this sort of thing then you really have to question whether those particular individuals are you know, concerned about this are being honest at all because yeah, you know when you don't I live do in a world where you can achieve that so there's a little bit of that too but i'm i mean i'm, I'm not reluctant to think that highly neurotic people coming together uh, and I, I mean, I, don't, I haven't seen stats. I'm, I'm just pulling this out of my, my butthole. But I would suspect people in urban environments, just due mm. to the environment, would be more neurotic. And mm. I, I'm, I'm just guessing. I have no idea. I'd have to ask Wojak uh, off the top yeah, of my head. But I was just thinking of him too. Yeah, you know, if, if you, you know, if you grew up in some bad area of Baltimore or Houston or something, it strikes me as you know, you'd be more paranoid if you lived in some town in Montana. I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it's possible, and, and, or neurotic, rather. So um, then we know m most people uh, with these types of leanings are from the coast, Cities. and mostly yeah. from urban environments. Um, yeah. And the Trump thing, I mean, think about it in, in the context we're just talking about. That's something you can you can worry about. I mean, it, it's, yeah. I guess, great, in air quotes, it's great if you really, if you want something that works. I kind of joke about, see, Trump's reelections that the worst thing that could happen to these people who will call them warriors is that he doesn't get reelected because then all they can say is, oh, Trump was so bad, he ruined everything. But if they get another four years, they can keep on complaining about him, make headlines, yeah. things like that. Um, so that might have been a, just a, a sort of trigger event for things, but... I guess the concern here is that, and and John, um, not Jonathan Hyde, Stephen Pinker points this out in various books, you know, Enlightenment Now or The Better Angels of Our Nature, that overall things are kind of improving. There are other things right. that don't seem to be, I know they don't really address that, maybe like depression, as for example, depression. Right. But sort of what Wojak once put is sort of 20th century problems, which really are a reflection of, of perennial problems, like uh, for example, um, poverty, um, mm. lack of nutrition, homelessness. It's a, I mean, these all persist, obviously. They always will be around, but it's better than it used to be. Um, yes. And so, and you can look at graphs that show this, and it's it's well documented. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm wondering if we're just kind of stuck on this path with a certain group of people that will perceive acute danger and problems no matter what 
rather than thinking, yeah, I guess things aren't that bad. Because well, that's kind of boring too, right? If you say, well, yeah, yeah, things are they, not that yeah. bad. It's, it's pretty boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think you're right about the perception issue because I'll, I'll share a story from back when I was in college 20 years ago with these people. There was a, a, a young woman who was telling a story about how uh, she was walking in her neighborhood. I don't know if she was out for a walk or if she was walking home exactly. I think she was walking back to her house. I don't know why she was out, but she was walking in her neighborhood and she told a story about how a car was following her around. And I, it's been so long, I can't give you the exact words that she used, but I remember listening to her and thinking to myself, now, mind you, this is back in the days before GPSs were common. Hmm. And I remember thinking to myself, the way she described the, the situation, it could have been someone slowly cruising through the neighborhood, looking to do some bad thing to, to somebody, or it could have just been a lost driver looking for an address. Yeah. I mean, you, you could have taken the situation either way, hmm. but you don't really know. I mean, nothing happened. So I would lean to the side of it was just, it was a lost driver looking for an address, or you could interpret it as they lost their nerve at the last second, you know, and they were going to do something. Hmm. But from her, you know, she insisted that this car was following her around uh, in her neighborhood. And I mean, I wasn't there. I don't even know if there was a car. You know, for all I know, she made the whole thing up just to impress her friends for some weird reason. But I, I was thinking about that, is that if you, in your day-to-day -day life, if you take the worst possible interpretation of every situation you're in, you know, like a, you're, you're at the... Catastrophizing. Um, yeah, catastrophizing. You know, like you get shortchanged at, uh, at the local uh, drugstore, mm. you know, from the cashier. Did they do it on purpose or did they do it because of the color of your skin? You know, or I mean, did they do it by accident or did they do it because of the color of your skin? Well, if you're going to catastrophize everything, it's because of the you know, color of your skin. Um, and there was there was one time I kind of stepped in it by accident. Um, it's it's sort of a sort of I don't know. Sometimes I want to. I was um, I was working in a gym, uh, and we sold smoothies. And a woman came up. She was, it was a black woman, and that's important for the story. And she, she asked for whatever kind of smoothie it was. And then I said to her, would you like a colored straw? And she said, excuse me? And she had a really strange look on her face. So I pulled the box out, and I said, we have purple and pink and green and blue, and there was a few other colors. I said, would you like a colored straw? And she said, oh, oh no, thank you. Let's take a regular straw. And, but she still had that weird look on her face, and she walked away. And I thought, thought about it later, that the word colored in America used to mean like people of color, mm -hmm. you know, like, or like the national association for colored people. Um, isn't that funny? Colored people these days is people of color, right? That's the yeah. I know it's people of color. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that she might have meant, uh, you know, do you want the Negro straw? Right. And that's not what I meant. I meant, do you want pink or green or blue or purple or whatever? Right. Uh, but if you, but, but the thing is, if you, if you took that situation and, you know, I'm a white dude and she's a black woman and, took it in the most negative light possible, you'd think I was gaslighting the poor girl, or not girl, woman. Um, yeah. And you know, if you're walking around with that filter on, whether it's race or gender or anything, you know, every day, all day, you know, the car didn't, it wasn't just a lost driver, it was, the car was following you around the neighborhood. Uh, you know, you weren't just shortchanged because of a counting error you know, they were doing this on purpose because they, they don't like you for your gender or your color or whatever else. And so you have this like self-reinforcing perception that that everywhere there's all this evil around you. And I don't know, how, I don't know if you could talk someone out of that kind of thing. Well, I can, you know, my own series of anecdotal stories that <clears throat> I have been mugged in, in an urban environment several times and I had been mugged in New York City and I, at times, I, I didn't grow up in an amazingly nice neighborhood, but neither was good. But it was adjacent to some not so great places, and so I'd have to travel on a train, bus, sometimes even walk through certain places. And then you definitely develop an acute sense of paranoia, um, mm. a, especially when you've had, uh, you could say, physical unpleasantness yeah. visited upon you. Thinking you're just looking everywhere. I remember at some point in time. 
in the wake of certain incidents, I would be riding the train as a as a teenager, and I would just, I, I just was terrified of making eye contact with various individuals, you know. So I would just keep my eyes on the floor the whole time, and that's a you know. And then couple that with just being neurotic. I mean, the environment amplifies everything. So if you have a natural right. tendency to be neurotic, then you're in an unsafe environment potentially. Uh, you're going to start thinking that. And catastrophizing, yeah. I mean, you, the, the problem I think here is that the peace people are doing this without self-awareness. I mean, very few people take the time to really take themselves apart. I know yeah. I'm neurotic by nature. I've never had it you know, measured because I just don't bother doing the test because of my insomnia. But um, I know, for example, that a lot of people would uh, not think about, well, probabilities, blah, 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 blah. Mm. And it only took me, I mean, not, no longer being in in that type of environment, far removed from things that actually did happen to me on occasion, to sit back and age as well uh, and, and think, you know, yeah, these were bad things, but they fall well within some statistical threshold. I mean, sometimes people get mugged. It's a shame. Yeah. Um, if you're in a neighborhood that's well known for not being particularly savory, it, it can happen. It does happen. And I don't think people like to look at those, mostly because we, we tend to personalize everything anyway. Mm. Yeah. Um, it, people think, yeah, whether it's you're being shortchanged or something bad happens to you, uh, that there's some somebody out to get you, or in some cases there's some cosmic you know, thing being visited upon you, and this is the issue I think with these people. They're not very reflective, and they think that everything is personalized because that's when you're really neurotic and paranoid. That's what happens. Everything becomes personalized. You don't look at it from a, a bigger picture perspective, and yeah, it sucks being mugged. I know what it's like, but Muggings are part of a statistical reality in pretty everywhere, even today, and it, it can happen. It's happened in the nineties, right. of course. Right. Um, so rather than looking at it from that perspective, they just think, oh, you know, the world is sort of out to get me. And you, you see this persecution complex with, well, with a lot of people, and, and, and sometimes it's precipitated by thing, real things that have happened. Right. Um, so, obviously, I mean, you look at the case of, say, civil rights and various things that happened to minorities. And there were a lot of bad things that happened to uh, people of color and other groups. Um, and this creates a kind of neurotic baseline uh, that people can sort of worry about. But the weird thing here, Monday, is I say that the people who are most vocal about this sort of thing, I would think, are not say, inner, pe- inner city people of color in some Baltimore hood. Right. They're, they're not, these are not, I mean, they have other concerns, right? Yeah, yeah. These are people who, are at, at the very least, are middle class. Mm. Th- from their own perspective, they're kind of, the, the urban environment, I mean, when you look at something like um, Ebony, Ebony lives are of importance uh, to mention mm. that. Um, yeah. one of the big accusations hurled at them is that they don't care about the actual physical impositions that are put on people, say, in uh, places like um, Chicago and, mm. um, you know, areas areas where there's a lot of this physical stuff happening and a lot of people um, ceasing to exist. They don't, why? Because they're, you know, supposedly funded by George Soros, but, you know, funded by whatever, and they're just detached from that. So there's that that disconnection, too. When, But I do think there's definitely something to this whole uh, neurotic picture, but you wouldn't get people to ever uh, concede that. And then, of course, just as we mentioned before, the, the echo chamber thing, that's pretty normal, right? You know, you're in an echo chamber... Everyone agrees with you. It feels good to have people in agreement with you. Mm. And when everyone's on the same page, it's, it's better. Uh, so people would claim. And why would you want to remove yourself from a comfortable environment? True. So I think all that's come together 
to create this mess. But what's alarming is that if indeed it's just a reflection of an ever safer environment and fewer and fewer concerns that used to be perennial, well, that means that this is going to keep on going on. I mean, I, unless, you know, I don't know, I'm projecting here 100 years in the future, you have some cyberpunk scenario, what are you going to worry about? I mean, most recently, there, somebody joked about this. There was a video on YouTube that was demonetized featuring robots, you know, like, something like robot wars, right? They're fighting each okay. other because it was depicted as animal cruelty. Oh. But the robots are not. So some friend oh. of mine joked that they're preemptively taking into account, you know, conscious AIs or something. But Yeah. Um, the, I just don't, that's my concern is that things are not actually, things aren't going to simmer down because if anything, if I'm if correct about any of this, it, it'll probably at least continue at the same level or get ramped up in the future because there will be occasional outbursts of physical uh, risk or danger or imposition. People will react to that. And the world, if you just look at statistics, is kind of getting better overall. People are safer. They have more money. Right. Uh, they're more educated. So, right. you know... It, I don't know. Uh, it's um, it's worrisome. Of course, it's worrisome for people like me, and I guess to you to some degree, because on YouTube there there's so many issues where it doesn't matter how milk toast you describe things or what have you. It, it just forget it. And something you've mentioned a few times mm. is that because we're approximately the same age, the this idea that you grew up with of, you know, not judging a person the uh, color of his skin, but the content of his character. Mm. I mean, maybe I was indoctrinated in that, but that's to this day how I just operate. I don't, yeah, you know, I'm same. not, yeah. I don't care about, I, mean, I honestly don't care about a person's quote unquote race. Um, if a person's a dickhead, he's a, or he or she is a dickhead. I'm not going to, you know, think, oh, this is the reason. Um, and ultimately, I think that's a probably the best way to deal with people as individuals and, and not look at them as, as a part of a collective group. <clears throat> but every every faction out there these days doesn't seem to like that. I mean, it, maybe it's just an old-fashioned way of looking at things, but it served me well overall. You know? Yeah, um, yeah I, I understand what you're getting at. I, there's been... Um, I've been trying to do some some kind of i've been trying to do research on this and i haven't been very good at it but i think part of the reason why we're seeing the the change to the group is that i think they make more money that way by doing those kinds of things like hmm. when the uh there was a some uh young men of uh, dark color uh got kicked out of a starbucks and there was a big outrage about it if I remember correctly, I think Starbucks ended up making donations to certain charitable organizations on the left. Donations, mm -hmm. quote unquote. You know, basically to, to make all the bad publicity go away. Um, and I've seen them say the same thing about like uh, Jess Jesse Jackson, that basically he was running a, a corporate shakedown of people saying, hey, there's not enough of my people in your corporation, so we're going to publicly embarrass you. Uh, but th this will go away if you make a donation to my um, you know, to my charity here. Hmm. So I, 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 there was, I don't know, I don't think this will get demonetized, but there was a guy who was active for a while and then banished named Frame Game Radio. I'm, and he, <clears throat> yeah, I know about Frame Game. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know about him personally. But well, I know seems, about his channel. The, the, okay. Because um, right. yeah, some of his stuff, he was basically making this argument. I don't know where he was getting his sources from, but. Um, he was pulling up really good documents on on some of this kind of stuff where you know it looks like part of the reason why they're they're pushing this kind of the ID poll thing is because they get money that way mm. you know and if and, and unfortunately if there's a financial reward for it people are gonna do it oh yeah yeah I mean it it all could be as simple as just yeah you you make money by well, it's a it's it's a, a it's a variant of sensationalism. 
Mm -hmm. in the case of, I, I don't know all the details in the Starbucks. I mean, the perfect no, example of, know. you know, this could just be paranoia or neuroticism. You know, the, 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 uh, from what I recall of that case, it really was just, you know, these were rules and applied to everybody, but... Yeah. Um, but they can make it look bad. Yes. And so if you, it could, it could just really come down to that where it's, it's a form of, uh, I don't call it financial blackmail, but just, uh, yeah. And, and that's a shame. Um, mm -hmm. because if that's the case, then we're almost guaranteed to keep on getting because people always want to make money and, yep. uh, they can just keep on talking about these things. But from my end perspective, what concerns me most are these restrictions on just saying things. I mean, yeah, I, I get it. You know, there there are people out there who legitimately are hateful, and they say things that would be incongruous with my worldview. And they do exist. I've <laughs> talked to them, unfortunately, <laughs> but the amount of verbal hopscotch, you know, you can, you have to go through to yeah. just say anything. Now, I've actually had an official, uh, well, I guess, I don't know if it's going to make it worse, but I, I've actually had an official hate speech warning from YouTube. Oh. Yes. And a video deleted. Yes. I'm running, I'm still under the warning thing, you know, three strikes are out, so I'm thinking it's October till it expires. Old video. Can you even say the name of the video? I... I don't know, oh, no. but I can describe some of the content of the video, I think. So the video was an older video um, sort of describing the differences in... Eh, hmm, I'm not of some of the Actually, you know, in any Just event... Just if you don't? Yeah, okay. in any event. It, it really was an, a, a pretty, I think, a pretty timid video, but it had something to do with sex differences and behavioral differences ah. and... You can imagine. Uh, was that the one where you were interviewing the lady from Eastern Europe? No, that was demonetized completely. Oh. But okay. but this was an older video, several years old. So, gotcha. I, I'm. I mean, anyone who knows me, I don't. You know, I'm not a a hate infused individual. Mm -hmm. And if I describe something, I try to be calm about it and to the best of my ability, uh, objective. But all these constraints, there, I'm. There are probably you know half a dozen to a dozen topics off the top of my head that I would like to make content on, that would involve exploring certain things that are just off the table. Because I know it's just it, they're just no goes. There's no way you can talk about it. There's yeah. no way, no way I could talk about it without risking the the life of the channel completely. So I just don't talk about it. So in a way, they've definitely um, succeeded. But now it's increasing the circle of, of, of restrictions. What can you? Well, I know for a fact that you can't talk about uh, when people are very unhappy and um, do things to make themselves go to heaven sort of thing, right? You, know? mm. you can't talk about that. You can't say that word. You can't talk about right. stats. You can't talk about, I've noticed, um, when people are really unhappy and... Um, consume happy pills, for example. Right. Okay. Can't talk about that either. Uh, there. I. I don't. I mean. I get it. I guess what the 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 end goal is to create this sort of sterile uh, environment where you know fluffy kittens, and I like looking at fluffy kittens too, and whatever. Yeah. And and puppies and what have you. That that's all you get, and and quote unquote you know, more normy tier stuff. But if people want to talk about substantial issues, um, I don't know how they're supposed to go about it. And the complete lack of distinction between... So we all get lumped in the same group. Even if you want to talk about anything that's remotely... I don't like the word controversial. controversial you're, you're, all, you're all a bunch of white soup cream... Yeah. Uh, well, haters some of everybody. Of this... yeah. Some of this is being weaponized because I've seen um, them talking about they wanted the gentr gentrification uh, of the video platform because that way they can turn into uh, a competitor for Netflix. You know, mm -hmm. so they want to get rid of anything controversial, anything that, that might scare the normies. And 
it wouldn't surprise me if that's basically what they were really doing um because there was i'll give you an example historically um back in the 1920 i think it was 1929 easter parade in new york uh there was a group of there was at least one woman and i think it was like a whole group that were set up on purpose they were walking in the easter parade smoking and they're smoking cigarettes openly and uh, some newspapers and that was at the time it was not it was considered taboo for women to smoke in public and they interviewed one of the women and she said well in basically she made a feminist argument for you know equality well if men can smoke in public you know so can i i'm a modern the brit woman that kind of thing and the whole thing was staged by it was funded by the american tobacco company yeah. uh to a pr for, firm to to now i don't know how effective it was for actually getting women to smoke in public but they saw an untapped market there you know if women are smoking in private well we get them to smoke in public they'll smoke even more <clears throat> pardon me so that means more sales for the uh tobacco companies so they hijacked the language of feminism uh, you know for corporate profits and if, if they i've seen some uh you know some reporting on the that youtube is trying to move in this more sterile direction so they can be a competitor for netflix and get a, a more normie audience so they'll use the language of uh you know the justice of the social kind so that uh they can cleanse the platform uh, basically i mean i'm not saying there's not a, a i'm sure there are people at at youtube and at google who are doing it um they're doing it for I don't conviction say, for reasons. Conviction. Yeah, conviction thank you yeah. thank you yeah for conviction um but if you want to cleanse a platform so you can change it to something else this would be a, a good way to cover your tracks you know the same thing like with the american tobacco company well we want women smoking in public uh so that more of you can have cancer but we can't come out and say that so we'll we'll say you know what this is for women's liberation there's one thing, though, that throws a wrench in that theory, and I'm not disagreeing with you. <clears throat> it doesn't apply to YouTube, but if you look at some of these recent superhero releases, I think was it Captain Marvel was the, probably the worst of the worst, where you have this sort of uh, exaltation of women for the sake of being women and um, you know, melanated individuals for the sake of being melanated individuals. Melanated. There's actually a, a channel called The Melanated Files. It's about the uh, melanated experience in Japan. It's kind of interesting, I guess. Huh. Um, yeah. In any event, th that so sort of Captain Marvel being it was a, just a huge flop across the board. Yeah. And sort of artificially changing, I don't know, the, the traditional I guess, features of a hero or, so, or some character. Um, when that seems to run against what would be the, 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 the profit margin idea that mm. why because Ghostbusters that you know there was that oh god example yeah. for a couple, couple of years ago where there was a um, a womanly Ghostbusters team and mm. that was a flaw nobody really enjoyed it and people didn't really want to see it so then you know this other angle where the entertainment industry is pushing certain things even though clearly they're not making good money off of it because right, right, right. Yeah. no one's really interested in it. People like well, comic book I could, films. Cause, oh, go on. I, I could come back at you and say, well, maybe it's that uh, there's no central organization to this, that uh, some of the motive is like they want to gentrify a, a platform to make it safer for the normies. Uh, maybe some of it is uh, conviction, like in the case of maybe Ghostbusters or Captain Marvel. And since there's no central coordination, that's why it looks chaotic and it looks like there's no, um, you can't point to one motive or one direction for all of it. You know, it's, it, it's just some of the people are doing it for one reason. Some of the people are doing it for a different reason. And hmm. you know, unless we can read minds, uh, we can't really know, but you do make a good point with that. Like why? Cause I've seen, I, I've, I've seen some commenters say they're actually ruining franchises on purpose. You know, they, 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 they hate you so much they want to ruin your childhood. Right. And, you know, sometimes it certainly feels that way. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if that's the, really what they're, they're after or not. Or maybe they don't know what they're doing. Maybe they're kind of 
and, and not just in, in, in a lack of central coordination kind of way, but maybe they're just going based on the feels. You know, like they could be. Also, I, I don't know. And this is this know. is the problem yeah. with limited information. We're yeah. left in the wilderness. And so, yeah, there are people that are 100% convinced, 110% convinced that this is just, you know, I don't know, reverse racism and the, it's just all ideologically driven. Maybe it's all about profit. I, I honestly, we just don't have access to that information, unfortunately. And um, we're going to be left to speculate. But the real, the one thing we do know is we're definitely constrained in what we can say. Yes. And it's annoying because there are a lot of interesting topics that I would like to explore in greater depth that at some point in time I used to sort of be able to that I can no longer do because, yeah, because it, I'm pretty sure it would risk the, the life of the channel. Mm. Um, and... You know, I've just kind of got a bit shoot set up, but my concern, I've said this publicly, about bit, bit shoots already, bit, bit shoot doesn't have the same level of traffic. I don't think it ever will. Yeah, very true. But more importantly, bit shoot <clears throat> has become known, understandably, as the place for, you could say, far right loonies. That's yeah. where the people go. I mean, recently there was a channel that was nuked. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to name Well, it got nuked. It was a. The one with the young lady? Um, or no, one. it was it was a different one. It was a, I won't name it, but it was a channel that was a quote unquote gaming channel meant to promote okay. uh, white supremacism. Oh, um, God. Yeah, in the form okay. of games. Yeah. But anyway, it was nuked, and but that channel I think is still up on BitChute. And so you have, uh, yeah, you have that situation where. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I don't, you know, I, I just don't really know what a, what a good option is. I don't think there there are good options anymore because the only thing, concrete thing we have is we know we're constrained. I mean, you know what it's like yeah. to have video instant demonetized. And here's the randomness. I've been testing this Monday. Mm. Sometimes I'll go through three or four different uploads, as in as in the same video, upload once, yeah. instant demonetized, up with different titles, mostly gibberish mm. titles. That used to be a technique that worked, you know, like... <laughs> You just put that right. in there. Then I change it to do, 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 and still not no go. Maybe sometimes it's the third or fourth time it is monetized, but then for six hours. And what I've noticed, and I think this is intentional, is they, so initial amount get monetized and then a couple hours. And then when you get peak traffic first two or three days, it stays demonetized. And then about five days later, they get back to you and say, oh yeah, we've reviewed it. You're all, you're good to go. Yep. Um, I know that, that to me too. Yeah. Yep, that seems to be a, uh, an active strategy. Um, Although they, I, I did discover one thing. Uh, there mm -hmm. was a, a video I did about um, the effect of looks when it comes to dating. Mm -hmm. And I had a real clickbait title to it. Um, it was called Women Only Care About Looks Part 2. Mm -hmm. And um, on one of my, I was, sometimes I cross post between my two channels because I'm lazy. On one of my channels, it was monetized. On the other one, it was put in limited state. And I was like, the content of the video was literally the same. What's what's Random. different? No. Actually I figured it out. because uh, I tried I started deleting and re uploading it, trying to figure out what was what was different, what was getting it demonetized on one channel, what was on the other. And it turned out it was the title card. Um, the title card on one of them had a woman a woman in a bikini. Um, and the other one, you know, she was a rather provocative pose. The other one did not. The other one was a um, basically a blue background. And then when I changed that, when I uploaded it to the, the demonetized channel with a different title card without a woman in a bikini and a provocative pose, all of a sudden it was monetized. So somehow they're scanning even the title cards themselves for images. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they're doing that, but. Uh, I, I try to be milquetoast in my imagery. Yeah, I've seen but, your title cards. I don't think it's your title cards, but I'm just yeah. letting people know that's one of the ways that they're doing this. Yeah, yeah. But there has to be some random element when you have, a, I don't know, like a picture of a watch and, you know, randomized titles. And for whatever reason, it's initially uh, demonetized. You get, you know, the, the ugly yellow sign. Yeah, and then, yeah. And 
the third or fourth one, it, it is monetized, but then six hours later it's demonetized. It's just bizarre. Yeah, and I, I can see the difference on my two channels too because the, the, uh, the one where I talk about dating has about 9,000 subscribers. Hmm. The other one, the Monday Blue channel, has about 11,000. And from the monetization, I make about three times as much on the smaller channel hmm. each month, which is doesn't make sense to me. I would think they would be making closer to the, to something like the well, same. views are the biggest determinant. Views are part of the problem, too, yeah. Uh, and, you know, you could have a channel with only 100,000 of, of my subs. other ones are... My, a lot of my Monday Blue uh, ones are put in limited states. So that's part of the problem. And really? That bad, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, yeah well, you do talk it's about, I mean, the, yeah, I the recent... Um, I mean, with that, I don't want to, I'm not going to go into this one, but, you know, for example, I suspect if anyone wanted to talk about uh, the uh, Stone EP incident in the lock, where the place where you're locked away, where, mm. you know, oh, that, yeah. you went to Happy Happy Land, I mean, <laughs> uh, the, anything like that, I guess, would be, you know. Yeah, it, it was originally put in limited state and then they mm. approved it, but yeah. Yeah, um, it, it strikes me oh as just, just there's some element of randomness sometimes, but they definitely have some kind of strategy. Um, I wish I could comment on the uh, the person in, in the person who supposedly runs YouTube because this individual, I I can't say anything, but it's um, you should watch some of content of this individual. And they give you a notion of what what's if you actually think that this person knows what's going on and how to run a business. But anyway, yeah, the impression I got is they're not um, no. they're not the brightest light bulb. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I kind of have that impression too. And I, that's something I've noticed in general that really bothers me is a lot of these people who are you can call our ruling class, I guess. They don't seem like very bright light bulbs, and I'm like, how did they get there? Well, in the case of, off? I guess this would be in the case of. Maybe I can euphem turn this to you. So, <clears throat> imagine if you had a startup business and you were nice and let somebody use your um, space that you owned, hmm. say a garage, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, for a while, and that these people, once they were successful, decided to pay you back for allowing you back then in the startup phase to use your space, and mm. there are family connections. Uh, mm. Sometimes, uh, you know, the, the, the N-E-P-O-T-I-S-M, uh, uh, in effect, and that's an example, in this case, of the um, individual who shall not be named, how this individual, the not where they are. Yes. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the professional uh, background of the individual who shall not be named, it, it's it's a total mismatch. Mm. It would be it would be like appointing some average person to the head of the department of mathematics at Princeton. It just wouldn't make any sense. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of that. I don't think, I mean, sometimes it's not the case. You know, Jeff Bezos is obviously, right. yeah, he's kind of Jeff Bezos. But, yeah, that, that's that's the thing. And it's really, here's a really interesting thing. This is tangential, but I'll bring it back here. I don't, there's this claim, right, that mm -hmm. the reason why they... They they're draconian about this. They don't they they're worried about advertisers. Okay, well, maybe that's the case. Maybe it's not. Let's assume it's not the case. Mm -hmm. I recently was listening to a Sam Harris podcast with an epidemiologist, and the epidemiologist who's we're just they're discussing the sort of evolution adaptations of bacteria to antibiotics and how it's a real genuine risk, and but they really struggle to get pharmaceutical companies on board developing new medications because it's not profitable. Because the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical people say flat out to the doctors and the scientists, look, 
um, I have a fiduciary loyalty. My first priority is the shareholders, not mm. the public. So if it's not profitable, it doesn't matter if it's a risk or, I mean, you could say that's a problem with capitalism and system, and it might even be legitimate criticism, but respect, irrespective. If they say, look, we have this fiduciary loyalty to the shareholders, if we need new antibiotics, but it's not profitable, we're not gonna make them end of story. Right. The weird thing, uh, and then we can, I guess, finish up, because I heard the, the, the- Sorry. No, 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 it's fine. Um, is that YouTube used to be run by somebody else, and as far as I know, they were primarily concerned with shareholders too. Um, and shareholders, I mean, they don't have to be non elite but yeah, generally speaking, they just care about money. Right. Um, to the point where you could argue it's even highly unethical. I mean, let's say they're, let's say what this epidemiologist is saying is true is that um, the rates of antibiotic resistance are, are have grown tremendously. It's it, people are going to start, you know, passing away due to this, and <laughs> the farmers are, well, we're not going to make it because it's not profitable. Um, maybe at some point in time when it really becomes apparent to the public. A real you know? problem. Yeah. yeah, but that's just how it always works. I mean, I'm more familiar with the I business business stuff of of say video game companies. I know you don't game anymore, but you know, game companies like EA. Horrible, horrible publisher. I don't know if you've heard of them. Mm. They used to host yeah, Bioware. Bioware is a felony. They're not even, they're just nothing anymore. They're mud. And, yeah. you know, the shareholders will just say, you're just to drop this IP. It doesn't matter whether it's cool. The people don't care. So the kind of concerns that Google broadly and YouTube specifically have seem kind of understandable, but also bizarre because it doesn't seem to be based on fiduciary loyalty or, or just shareholder profit, it's, 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 it's much more personalized. Mm. And I've talked to Coltain before about this, about the, the prospect of it's entirely possible to run a platform at a deficit, meaning, and to this day, I'm not an expert, I don't know. I've been told many times that YouTube does not run at a profit. I've heard that over, mm. over and over again. I'm assuming it's true, people tell me that, I don't know. If that's the case, then there's something else in place that is just bizarre because it seems in this case, if, that, if it's true, that ideology trumps what is a perfectly normal business practice. And you might decry that, you know, it, it, it actually does sound pretty icky when people say, we're not going to make new antibiotics because well, it's not profitable, but at least you can, it's predictable. Yeah. In this case, it's just bizarre because it doesn't seem to fit the mold of how every other business in the world is run. All people care about in business, I want, maybe I'm generalizing, but essentially most, all people care about at the end of the day are, the, are shareholder profits. Everything else is an after effect in business as you're aware. So, you know, liking, uh, having people like a certain product, whether they're shoes, video games, barbecue sauce, yeah, those are the, the customers. But the, the shareholders don't care. They don't, maybe they like the barbecue sauce, maybe they don't, they don't care. They want to make a profit. That's not how YouTube yeah. works. It's bizarre. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're getting at. Um, it, it makes sense what you're saying. Uh, let me, this, this is going to sound wacky, but let me throw an idea uh, at you. You know, it's not just like, as far as I'm aware of the way it works, I think it's a, called ABC Corporation or something like that. Is it one that actually owns YouTube? Hmm. You know, it's not just one corporate entity that's there. So let me make an analogy with um, with airplanes. Okay, let, let's say that you're an airplane manufacturer and you make really bad airplanes. So your company doesn't really make a profit. But you also own a second company that uh, makes airplanes for the Air Force. And I don't, the Air Force comes to you and says, you know what, we want your, your other company to make these bad airplanes to sell to, to you know foreign governments and it'll, it'll it'll be at a loss but they'll get worse airplanes than than the US Air Force will get hmm. so your one company is making a whole it makes an, enough extra money uh, from the US Air Force and sells that those planes exclusively to the US Air Force that the other one can take a loss and it doesn't matter and I mean I'm not saying something like that is going on here where they're they're shifting money around or there's shadowy government entities that are um, mm. subsidizing Google or YouTube. But 
I guess unless we can actually see their um, their balance sheets or their, you know, like where all the money's coming from and where it's all going. Yeah, pure speculation. Yeah, there's got to be some reason they're doing it. And if if they weren't making money somehow, they wouldn't they wouldn't be able to stay around. They go out of business. Oh yeah, yeah. You, you know, so there's like, or I'll, I'll give you a, a maybe a less can let's say uh, less Jones hmm. Alex example uh, of. There was a, a small sushi restaurant that I would go to back when I lived uh, near D.C. And I really liked the place. But I wondered how it stayed in business. Because, you know, they have enough people there, um, like on the weekends. But the weekdays, it was always very, very empty. Like, I couldn't imagine how they were making money because there just wasn't enough people. Hmm. And later I found out that the woman who ran it, her husband owned a steel mill. And basically, this was something for his wife to do. Um, I don't know how the corporations were structured, but uh, they could write off the losses and you know for taxes. So it didn't really matter if that if the sushi place made a profit or not, because right. uh, her husband owned the steel mill. Now again, not a perfect analogy with with uh, YouTube, but there are effectively the sushi restaurant was kind of a fake business if you're looking at businesses from the point of view of of profits. Right. Uh, now in this case, it was just a family <laughs> thing, you know, and there was no grand effect on society and no one really you know it, it's not it, it's not going to change the the course of american history that this you know little sushi place existed um but yeah there's there's weird things that go on behind the scenes like that with corporations that if you didn't know the backstory it kind of doesn't make sense and we're left to speculate that's why i'm, I'm yeah, not sure i'm just throwing yeah. out ideas uh because it, it does seem pretty bizarre in light of how we traditionally understand business works. So I, I, I honestly uh, don't know. Yeah, and I don't know either. I guess, as I've said a few times, that we're just left to play verbal hopscotch and just kind of hope for the best. I, no, it's, uh, I, I just, I just, there, I just, I don't see the emergence of a new platform that's a competitor. And I don't see uh, options outside good options outside of youtube yeah supposedly that canadian college professor is gonna um oh, come out with it yeah. he's gonna come out with that platform and I, I went to the website and signed up for email alerts but when it's gonna come out will it be that'll, that'll i don't think that'll ever happen he doesn't have the money i mean he's making tons of money the canadian yeah. professor but he's not not anywhere in the league i mean what would be required would be a jeff bezos now, yeah. would Bezos and no, I, I mean, yeah, I think the problem is that YouTube emerged as a sort of organic thing. Nobody knew what it was become, and then just yeah, people got on it and started talking about things that no one had ever talked about in public, yeah. and that was not predicted. I mean, maybe they did think oh, it's fluffy cats and cute puppies or whatever, um, yeah. but. It turned out not to be, at least partially, not to be the case. Um, and now they're just kind of dealing with that. And I think, well, there is on a final note because the day is late for you and or the night. And um, mm. there was, there is that German. You heard about that German uh, union organization? I'll, what I'll about consent. It? Yeah. Well, they they're going. They're gearing up to go up against YouTube. I don't know that. Yeah, I can. Tr I, I'll dig it up and send it to you later. Um, okay. In DM, but basically, they they're trying to create a scenario, and I don't. Know, they claimed had a legal case. I'm trying, it's this huge German uh, sort of workers' union organization, and they claim that YouTube <clears throat> is basically if if we're on YouTube, we're basically employees of YouTube, and therefore oh. this is their argument. And therefore, we have access to employee rights as would anybody in the context of a, of a job. I mean, you have to do certain things, but you also, you know, right? And so demonetizing you, for example, without give, telling you why, or removing videos without telling you why, right. um, all these things, these, these would fall within the purview of employee. For example, if you were an employee at a company and you know consistently your your paycheck arrives a week later in the month, I mean, you would have a right to know why. So yeah. things like that. 
And so their whole spin on this is that they're going to try to create, uh, yeah, basically a, a legal case that people are employers of, of YouTube content creators and that if they if they're going to continue this way that it's a violation of employee rights do they have a chance i don't know but the huh. the organization and i'll send you a link later uh is yeah. is pretty pretty well known in in germany and I, I they seem they have lawyers and everything go i think they're pretty gun i mean pretty gun ho about going through with it i don't think it'll be successful but um yeah it's it's interesting it's interesting development uh, it's it's basically the idea of uh, I mean uh, allowing people, you know, to be, to be informed about certain things because we ultimately we don't yeah. know why things are demonetized, why they're uh, taken. Some of this is arbitrary. Um, there's no person. There's, nothing, there's no person to contact unless you have sure. f five million plus subs. Yeah. Um, you can't talk to anybody. Yeah. There's nobody. There's nobody. You know. Whereas if you were an employee uh, at an office and your paycheck or I three weeks, you could, you could call somebody up. You could figure you know, talk yeah, to the finance can. office. Yeah. You can't do that with YouTube. You just you have yeah. no idea what's going on. So, you know, because here's the thing, and this is the most concerning thing. <clears throat> YouTube isn't going to label everything as quote unquote hate speech, but, they could, and for smaller channels like ours, and what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? Yeah, they could yeah. say every everything is hate speech. Oh, your your cat is uh, your cat is hate speech. Uh, this right. is hate speech. Strawberry Sundays are hate speech, and I mean it would be ridiculous, but you know what, what could you possibly do? And so yeah, I think even though I don't think they'll be successful, it's I think this thing is a this German organization is a move in the right direction, um, because. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, just even being informed why they're making decisions would be uh, a step up uh, from the current state of affairs, which is uh, just, I mean, imagine that. It, it is weird. I mean, content creators make, whether they like the content or they, with the ads, they make YouTube money. Yeah. But you have no, zero transparency, no idea what's going on, why they make decisions. It's well, it, it, bizarre. It, it's not just, it's not just the zero transparency. It's also, you know, if, if you, I mean, I've only been on YouTube for two years, but you know, if I was here for the last uh, 10 years, let's say, let's say I made a video 10 years ago that back then was absolutely okay for their, mm. um, for their speech policies. Yeah. But today in 2019, it now it's violating their speech policies. So I get hit with a, a strike on my channel. That was happening to me. Yeah, that was right. And the thing is, something. the thing about that is, if you think about like the regular, the way the regular law works, you know, if they pass a law saying, uh, you know, doing this thing is illegal, well, they they can't apply it in reverse. They right. can't say retroactively. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah you, they can't apply it retroactively. And yet, on platforms like YouTube, oh, they yeah. will apply policies <laughs> retroactively. Yeah, I've had several yeah. videos uh, deleted or put in limited state. Older videos. Um, I probably lost a good 20 to 30 videos of, of total. I, I'd be close to it, maybe a total of 1,000 videos for now. They're, I don't know the total number I've lost, but yeah. Yeah, because that's what they do. They retroactively apply this. And right. it's a bizarre situation because you never, there's no normal employment situation. I mean, I, I guess it's a bit of a stretch called it, but that's what this organization called it, where you just right. don't have any idea what's going on, why decisions are being made. Um, you know, if you get fired from a job, typically they'll say, oh, you poor, perform poorly or we're just downsizing. They'll give you a reason. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, company's taking no losses. Here, it's yeah. just, oh, we don't like this. And, and it, yeah, it, I, I, there, I know for a fact there's an element of randomness because the, it's not, in my case at least, I always upload with gibberish titles. I alternate and I have multiple attempts where you know, the third time, fourth time, it's monetized only for it to be done. I don't know. So it's, um, yeah, I mean, I hope this German organization is successful. Uh, yeah. You know, but I, I don't think so. They seem very, remember that, ah, we can't talk about that either. 
the revelation a few months ago involving the project of truth uh, and the internet. oh them yes. yes well when they talked about um, you know breaking up the the big cookie into smaller bits of cookies they said that mm-hmm. they would never allow that to happen so mm. yeah anyway so yeah I'm, I'm not but I, I will be I'll send you a link on that and I'll be following that yeah uh, something like closely that, yeah. uh, to see what's going on if they've made any progress whatsoever I'm I'm skeptical but I'm I'm also you know I, I, I'd encourage it you know because any, anything's better than the current state of limbo we're in right now yeah anyway but it is late over there it is somewhat early I need to start my day on my minimal sleep um, everyone should know what your channel is unless I'll, I'll link it because I mean you're Monday you're the famous blue Monday blue so yeah did you um, like my Legend of Monday Legend of Zelda title cards yeah they're really creative there's uh, yeah. they're definitely you're kind of going digging back into the old sort of gaming lore oh a yeah. final point yeah you mentioned yeah in your talks with um this woman that's a vampire and i i sent you the i think that image of fifth edition oh yeah the fifth edition yeah that yeah it's become pretty uh awake yeah it's it's a awake kind of thing but yeah that, that's another thing that's bizarre i mean we already talked about how, this how that got into that culture because nobody cared about that stuff in that yeah. sector right yeah, it's kind of it's it's almost kind of interesting. Like you get one person infected, yeah. and then it just spreads through everything else. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's bizarre, but I I don't know. There uh, there's going to be next year a, a game based on fifth edition, and mm. apart from poor facial animations and combat, I'm a bit worried about how awake it might be. Uh, yeah. I'd prefer it to be more asleep, but I guess we'll see. I guess we will. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I will link to your channel as always. Uh, for those of you who don't know Monday, you should do it now. He's a, he's a famous YouTuber. Um, and I will check you guys out later. And hopefully, uh, if I'm alive and well, I will uh, put out more content. And Monday will too. He's very diligent. So everyone take yeah, care. and. Thank, thank you for having me on. No, oh, thank you for joining me. It's always a pleasure. I always like looking into those beautiful cat eyes of yours. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Okay, take care and have a good night. You too. If you liked this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.